there are three last segments to cover in the hematology, and one of them is what happens in pregnancy. It should just, should just be remembered that pregnancy is not a disease, it's a physiological process, and therefore to find the patients that find the individuals who should really not be called patients, mildly anemic with mildly low platelet counts uh, is normal and it's vitally important to distinguish the physiological range that's acceptable from those where this is abnormal and the patients require usually iron replacement and bear in mind that with low platelets or thrombocytopenia occasionally this might not be attributable to the pregnancy but might actually be due to an autoimmune disease needing steroid treatment. Now in pregnancy there is a different situation in which the mother may have a fairly serious disease going into the pregnancy and a classic example, classic example would be sickle cell disease in which they have very severe anemia and the mothers often will lose the pregnancy uh, often will have stroke, often will have renal failure and so when the patient with a low haemoglobin is seen in pregnancy it's very important to be certain that there's no underlying serious illness that will alter the way in which the pregnancy is conducted. One other aspect of pregnancy which is being increasingly appreciated is what's called venous thromboembolism, a propensity to clot in the pregnant mother and this sometimes is a consequence just of the pregnancy but occasionally may signal uh, the occurrence of a congenital or inherited defect. And so any mother who sees her obstetrician with a swollen leg or funny clotting is deserving of a proper hematologic con consultation and clarification. And if we move on penultimately to the bleeding patient, Physiologically, as we go through our daily lives, we're constantly being bumped and bruised and fortunately do not have sustained hemorrhage. However, the situation where there is inappropriate bruising or prolonged bleeding from minor injury signals the need to investigate the patient complaining of this problem carefully. For example, this may occur on a congenital basis being present from childhood and those individuals um, where the commonest cause is an entity called von Willebrand syndrome which is a combination of abnormality in platelet function and in a clotting factor, factor 8, um, may give rise to very serious bleeding particularly if the history is known, not attended to and the patient goes to operation for example to have a child delivered without anybody having realised that there is an underlying serious um, predisposition to bleeding. More often they are acquired, that means that the patient is born normal and abnormalities develop over time, examples being um, abnormality in the bone marrow, particularly as we said earlier, increase in platelets. Um, but some of the other things that give rise to bleeding that are really very important and it is impossible to emphasize the importance um, of taking a careful history about drugs because, for example, patients who have atrial fibrillation or anticoagulants might be receiving warfarin and it is uh, these patients that occasionally will bleed, particularly if their diet's changed or they receive new medication. Also, there is a need to recognize that occasionally uh, events in the environment may give rise to very severe bleeding for example, snake bite where envenomation may give rise to profound hemorrhage. And also just remember that uh, a number of these patients give a very clear history of bleeding in male children who sisters are unaffected and this would be an example of a congenital bleeding disorder called haemophilia of which there are a number of variants. Again, the point about uh, understanding how safely to manage the hematologic patient with a bleeding disorder. Careful history, careful family history, careful drug history, careful examination, and then the discreet, reasoned use of laboratories, not a blanket effect, trying everything at once, but rather using laboratories to confirm a working diagnosis. 
and loss to Endorf is an area which is becoming hugely problematic for us and that are the events that lead to clotting of the thrombotic disorders on the arterial side or on the venous side. Now some may be acquired and are found lifelong and represent abnormalities in naturally occurring clotting mechanisms. We don't need to get into specifics other than to perhaps remember that if there is a history in a patient who clots as a stroke for example or a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, it is very important that this individual be investigated by a competent a clinical or laboratory haematologist to be certain that they have not inherited anything from mother and father. But a number of these clotting events occur uh, as a result of lifestyle change. So for example, if we were to look at all the patients getting off South African Airways landing at Heathrow and test the patient for clot which we had not picked up, it would be surprising to find that with proper investigation a number of patients have already initiated this event which would then become clinically evident in a few days. So for example, prolonged, uh, particularly uh, intercontinental travel. Other things that are particularly ominous are patients with cancer where they have a high predisposition, high predisposition to clotting and the, the point to take home in the thrombotic disorders, the clotting disorders, is that everything once you have a suspicion can be dealt with by appropriate tests in a well-trained, well-structured um, hemostasis laboratory and why that's important is because that dictates the approach to anticoagulant therapy and it should just be noted um, as we get to 2012 that the range of anticoagulants are changing, they're becoming safer, easy to use and perhaps as efficient, perhaps even more efficient. So just on the way out to just make one final comment and that is that um, with the development of new treatment products in the pharmaceutical industry, it's possible to stimulate individual aspects of blood formation. So as we said earlier, we could give erythropoietin for anemia. But suppose the patient had too few white cells. Could we stimulate the white cells? Yes, we could. We could give them a product called granulocyte colony stimulating factor, marketed as agents such as um, or perhaps we shouldn't use the trade names, marketed as GCSF. And these are very, very helpful, mostly useful after treating patients who in the old days of cancer chemotherapy died from infection, now could be brought through the treatment much more safely. So I wish you lots of success in your career as underwriters. And remember that uh, help is as far away as only one phone call. Thank you very much.